Hungry Trilobite podcast would like to acknowledge conventions such as WeedonCon. WeedonCon is a fan-generated charity event for Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Angel, Firefly, and all Joss Whedon creations. It is scheduled for October of 2020 and is held in Los Angeles, California. A portion of the proceeds benefit the Los Angeles LGBT Center as well as the Ron Glass Memorial Scholarship. See details at WhedonCon.com. On mic today, we have Neil Perry Gordon. How are you doing this fine afternoon? I'm good. Thank you, Aaron. It's good to be I'm here. Glad to have you. So you are an author of many things, including historical fiction, something I enjoy quite a bit. Oh, good. And, and you have a new book out on the 20th of June. Yes. Uh, Hope City will be released on June 20th, the summer solstice. Nice tie in. Nice tie in. Does that relate to the story at all? It relates to the fact that um, the summer solstice in Alaska is a big deal because the mm-hmm. summer is a short, very short season, as you can imagine. So they really honor the summer solstice up there. Um, so when I was looking for a date um, to tie it in for a release, there's not many holidays in June, except I think Log Cabin Day comes up. So I was uh, talking to my friend who lives up in uh in Alaska, and I was saying, what's a good time to do it? He goes, the summer solstice is perfect. So that's how we, we picked it. And so it's June 20th, 2020. The summer solstice will be the release date of Hope City. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, I'm looking forward to picking that up for sure. Uh, I've glanced over your website. I, I wanted to pick up one of your books and haven't really had a chance to do that yet because of the, the past week and whatnot. Um, but one thing I noticed is that you, you do have a love of history and that's something that definitely re- resonates with me quite a bit. Is there a historical period you gravitate toward? Um, well, yeah, well, um, most, all my books, except for one take place in the early part of the 1900s. Um, okay. Hope city is 1898. Um, Macabre's tale is 1910. Uh, bomb squad is 1916. Um, the Righteous One, though, is 1960, and um, Moonflower is in 1670. So that's the one that's sort of really far back in history. Mm-hmm. So, I, you know, I it, it they sort of just happen. Um, I'm working on a new book now, uh, two new books. Uh, one takes place in uh, Argentina in 1924, and I'm doing a sequel to Hope City, which takes place in 1900 and that takes place in Nome, Alaska. So it looks like we're dealing with a lot of industrial age or very early post-industrial stuff, uh, class struggle, uh, government espionage, things like that. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, there's a different theme to each one. Um, you know, the first one, A Cobb's Tale, is about immigration, in particular Jewish immigration. Mm-hmm. Uh, that that story is is predominant in in Akaba's tale. Um, Moonflower is a, is a journey um, of a of a young man um, seeking the Great Spirit in the 1670s. Uh, his life with the indigenous cultures of that time. Uh, and the Righteous One is a metaphysical fiction, so it's not historical fiction. It's my one book that's not, and that's a journey of. Um, uh, between good and evil, it's, a, it's the story between good and evil that takes place in the dream world, sort of a journey of the consciousness type of thing. Um, but it's a tie into A Calvis Tale. It's a sequel to A Calvis Tale. Bomb Squad is strictly historical fiction, takes place uh, uh, in 1916, right before the United States is entering World War One, and takes place in, in New York City area. Uh, and then Moonflower, I'm sorry, then Hope City is about um, the uh, gold rush. Uh, in Alaska in 1898. And uh, it's an interesting story about uh, two young boys, 17-year-old boys, graduate high school from San Francisco and head up to Alaska um, to participate in the gold rush. So that's where I'm at so far with my with my books. Really cool. Really cool. Um, well, I'm, I'm thinking here, do you have, a, is there a certain motivation you have for writing? Because I'm getting a, a lot of passion from you about each story you have each one is almost like it's literally its own little creation there is there a certain driving force for making these certain stories well i mean it's a, it's a passion to write a story i like historical fiction because i like tying my fictional characters in with history 
Um, I, I like reading historical fiction, number one. So mm -hmm. I, I find it um, productive uh, because you also are learning something while you're being entertained. And it's a nice way to digest history. Um, so that's why I like reading it. So I like I like writing about it as well because I do the research and I learn all sorts of things I never knew before about a time period. So um, I was able to um, do the stuff that um, that taught me um, new things about different eras, especially um, like Moonflower, for example, about indigenous life in the 1600s was was fascinating. And that's the kind of learning you can't get from a history book. It, it's good to know the whys and hows, but to know it, it's very hard to get into the, the heads of people who are living in that time. Yeah, that's, that's exactly it. So when you get into historical fiction, you know, you, 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 I'm not focusing on main characters of the time, the, you know, the ones that are all historical. So if you're writing a, historical fiction about Abraham Lincoln's time, you know, you might have him as a character there. But, you know, there's many characters in that story that, will, um, you know, try to bring it to life. And that's what makes it interesting is when you find out the interactions of, as, as we live, people say, you know, what's going on now with the, with the COVID, uh, will you write a story about that? Um, and, you know, it's still, it's still too fresh to write anything mm -hmm. about. But what, what, it, what I am interested in from what's going on now is looking at the, and I live in the New York area, so I, could, I see this, you know, really pr prominently, is people's reactions. You know, when you go to the grocery store, everyone's wearing a mask, of course, and all you see is their eyes. So you pick up on, you know, people's expression through their eyes, be it their fear or, or anger or, you know, warmth, whatever it is, they're very expressive. And then I think back of the, uh, the Spanish flu in 1918 and how we felt back then is probably how we're feeling right now. You know, people wearing masks, people were quarantined. There was a lot of people who didn't want to wear masks. There was this, you know, these battles with forcing people to wear masks. And, you know, this, the stories are not that different uh, as they were over 100 years ago, a little bit over 100 years ago. Of course, we have better medicines now, um, but the human interactions were the same. So I might write a story about the Spanish flu now, having experienced a pandemic myself. Um, you know, living through it. And uh, so that's how I would approach something like that by taking, you know, the the uh, the subtleties of how we all interact with one another and using that to develop the story. That's really neat. And that's something that'll be very striking whenever you read something like that, is that one second you're reading about an experience that is completely alien to anything we'd have in this day and age. And the very next thing you read is like, that's I know exactly how that person feels because we're doing the exact same thing for the exact same reason. Um, I, I mean, you, you deal with things like, you know, fashion, technology, these things change, but the, the motivations, they remain the same. And like you said, when when you're dealing with a, a plague today and a plague 100 years ago, it's not that different at all. No, we're still humans. We still we still react the same way. You know, 100 years is not enough for, for really to see any evolution of, of man. I mean, you know, we still act as, as crass as we did 100 years ago as we do today. So, um, you know, it, it, it takes uh, many, many hundreds of years, I think, to see any sort of, you know, evolution to a, to a, a more of a, you know, a, um, a developed human than, than we are at the moment. Yeah. Uh now, let me ask you this, because I do like a lot of historical fiction, too, and I find that it comes in two flavors. There's the one that you're describing to me right now, where it's like you're trying to tell a fictionalized version of real events, where you're trying to illustrate to the reader what life was like. And then there's the type that tries to tell a story that maybe the what what we know of history is completely wrong, and there's an alternate explanation. Do you enjoy that as much? Yeah, um, I, you know, you always try to look for the truth. I think that's the the the, the real point of writing historical fiction is to find that it's a, it's a search for the truth to find out what was it really like at that point. You know, and you try to, yeah, of course, it's all in my imagination that I'm trying to recreate these things, um, and um, I'm, I, it's it's a way that um, too. It's a little bit of a of a time travel to go back go, go back in time. Um, so yeah, it's it's a search for the truth. I think is is probably the the biggest motivation um, that I have trying to trying to develop these stories. Um, 
and there's many more to come. Uh, I have several in the uh, in the pipeline. I have uh, two, well, two man one manuscript that's done. I'm waiting for to get to my editor. Another one that just began, and I have um, at least one more that I know that I'm going to be doing following up with uh, with the third. So you've got a lot in the pipeline then, and that's pretty cool. Do you have like a, a grand vision here where it's like you want to have a, a a universe of books or even move it into like a, a series or movie? Or are you just doing it one book at a time as the, the motivation takes you? Yeah, um, well, um, I have two series I'm working on. One is The Bomb Squad, which was the first uh, the first one. I'll be doing a second book for that. And also I'll be doing The Alaskan Adventures of Percy Hope. So Hope City is the is called The Alaskan Adventures of Percy Hope, book one. And then Cape Nome, which takes place two years later in Nome, Alaska, which would be the the adventures, the Alaskan Adventures of Percy Hope, book two. Um, and who knows? I mean, Percy Hope could be an ongoing character in my books if if it becomes popular enough. Um, so that's fun to have a to have a figure or have a character that could sort of develop into multiple uh, multiple books in a series. Um, but haven't gotten, you know, it's it's one book at a time at this point because it's so hard, you know, to, to encapsulate uh, all these things. It takes so long to write a book um, and then to get it, you know, to go through the editing process and getting it published and stuff. So, yeah, it's it's not it's not quick. Um, but, you know, I don't know. We'll just see where it takes me. Well, that's cool enough. I'm, I'm noticing a trend with Alaska popping up in a couple examples here. And I've always had a fascination with Alaska, but I've never been there myself. How did that become part of the the series? Well, I go there every summer. Uh, I've gone okay. there the last 12 years, and I go to this town of hope, which I wrote the story about. So there was this, there's this legend, this legendary story of how the town of hope was named. And so I uh, I took that that uh, little snippet of a of a of a idea, and I turned it into a novel. So my goal was to go up this year and, you know, release the book in hope. Um, well, we'll see. I'm supposed to go up in July. So I'm not sure that, um, you know, all the, uh, the flying and everything else will be safe to go. But that's my intention. So, yeah, I go up every year to hope I have good friends up there. And that's why I spend a lot of time there. OK, so uh, you're going there every summer. What draws you to the place and what made you say this is what I this is why I want to write a book is about this place here? Is it a, is it the people? Is it the history? Is it a little of everything? Well, the how Hope was named was interesting. It used to be a mining town. OK, back 100 years, 122 years ago, um, there was two cities. There was Hope and there was Sunrise. Sunrise doesn't exist anymore. It's an abandoned city. Hope still exists. Um, but in the heyday, in 1898, Sunrise was the most populous city in all of Alaska. Over 8,000 people were there during that particular summer. Um, people flocked there. Um, a year or two before, people on the Klondike in Canada. Uh, and so a lot came from there because it was a lot easier getting to Sunrise and Hope than it was getting to the Klondike. Uh, so a lot of people flocked there. A lot of people found some gold. Um, but it didn't take long for the gold to be mined out rather quickly. So you have a couple summers there of, of, of miners um, who then actually left there and went up because the, the big the big deal was up in Nome. Mm -hmm. When discovered gold in Nome, that was the big the big thing because they discovered that gold was on the beach. It was a lot easier to get the gold just by digging in the sand than it was going into the rivers and creeks and and spending a lot of time plaster mining. So, um, you know, everyone ran up to Nome. So a place that was not didn't exist it was it was no such city as Nome. Um, in the year 1900, 30,000 people were there, um, and it became the largest post office in America uh, for that that particular year. And even Wyatt Earp was that was there. So um, I did then, not know that. Yeah, Wyatt Earp went up there to open up. The, he was partner in the uh, Dexter Saloon, which was the most popular saloon uh, that in the northern. A book was written called The Spoilers by Rex Beach, where they made five movies were made from that, and the most famous one was in 1942 starring John Wayne and Marlena Dietrich. And uh, I watched that movie, it's, 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 it's quite, actually good. Um, it's kind of fun to, to watch a, um, an old John Wayne movie. Uh, and that takes place in Nome. It's a story of what happened at that time in, in the year 1900. So I'm recreating that story in my next book. 
Um, so that's that's but that's really just in the beginning stages. OK, well, that's fair enough. That's fair enough. I, I just like I said, I love travel stories. I love I like the idea of Alaska. I'm hoping to get up there at some point. It's worth it. I, yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm in a landlocked state, so it, it's definitely going to be a trick for me. Yeah, get on a plane. It'll take you there. Yeah. I, you've got a real flair for talking about this kind of stuff. Have you ever considered doing a podcast or YouTube series? Um, I'd rather be writing. Um, okay. It has, if I'm going to be spending time, um, you know, writing. Uh, I, don't, I, I like doing podcasts. I like going out and talking about it. But um, I, 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 like, I need to spend as much time as I can actually creating and, and writing. Um, and, and then trying to create awareness for who I am so people could know that these books exist. Um, it's hard, you know, these days to be a bookseller. You know, it's, uh, mm -hmm. there's so much out there. You know, today especially, anyone could write a book and put it on Amazon. So there's a lot of competition. And uh, so I work very hard, not only writing the books, but also marketing the books. So you're not only a book writer, mm -hmm. but you're a seller. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it takes, uh, it's, you know, you know, two tasks to uh, to do. But, you know, so I'm a podcast guest rather than a podcast host. Fair enough. Fair enough. I just I, I'm noticing the, the way you described not only your books, but Alaska and, and just it, I just I just think you would have a talent for it if you had to take a knack at it. But you, you, you make a really good point there is that, uh, you know, I've done some writing myself. I have a lot of authors on and it's it's become a catch 22 for anybody in the, the audience who isn't really familiar with this. On one hand, there's no gatekeeper anymore. If you want to publish something, it's as far away as your keyboard to do it. You don't have to be approved. But even if you are approved by one of the big publishing houses, they still expect you to do all your marketing on your own. It's not like it used to be. If you're a big name author like a, you know Stephen King, you know, or Don Winslow or, you know, Dan Brown, you know, mm -hmm. those those people are, you know, the top top. But yeah, if you're if you're published with a traditional publisher, they still expect you to, to do marketing. Uh, so yeah, it's it's not it's not easy either way. Um, though I am trying to now pick up an agent uh, mm -hmm. going the traditional publishing round. Yeah. And yeah, that that's it's nice to have the person who can at least talk to you know the various publishing houses if you want to work with another uh, another IP, they can make those connections there too. It, it does help. Yeah, well, you can't talk to a publisher without an agent. They, right. they really protect their industry, so it's like you know you have to go through the agent, mm -hmm. you know, and talk to the publisher. So yeah, you have to go you have to go that route, and that agent gets fifteen percent. So you know mm -hmm. that's why you know the the royalties as a traditional publisher is not nearly what the royalties would be as an independent. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but you know what you get is other benefits that you would not get as independent. Mm -hmm. Volume mostly. Your volume and uh, you don't have to lay, you know, you're not the one laying out the money for your editor and your book cover design and, you know, all those expenses. You know, they pay those up front. Um, and hopefully you get some sort of upfront money as well before, you, you know, before, you know, you, you publish a book. So there's pros and cons to both. But I'm going to pursue that, I think. I think that's the next step for me. That's one thing I definitely noticed about your book. As a self-published author, you have incredible cover design. Oh, thank you. And I didn't bring that up right away because, you know, as the author, the cover is not really what you're concerned about. But I notice a lot of self-published people have god awful art. I mean, I, I would really rather have plain text on a plain color background than bad art just because right. it undervalues your work. But your work is is well represented on your covers, especially okay. I think the Bomb Squad is my favorite. Yeah, that's a good cover. I mean, I do pay to have my covers professionally designed. And I have a couple design book cover designers, one in particular who did he did Bomb Squad, he did Righteous One. Um, so he'll he did that. He'll be doing my new one, White Slave, coming up. Um, so yeah, he he's a wonderful book designer, book cover designer. So how long ago? This is 2020 now. How long ago did your first book come out? A cobbler sale came out in the fall of 2018. Okay. So and you've in two years self-published sounds like half a dozen books. There's five books that have been okay. self-published to date. By the end of this year, I should have at least two more published. Mm -hmm. um, maybe three. We'll see. So at least two more. So that'll be 
in about two and a half years, there would be about seven, seven novels published. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. Cause I, there are a lot of people and I'm not going to name names, but you know, when you're in writing workshops, you know who they are, who have been working on the first draft of their first book for 10 years now. I know. I know. And, and, and it's like, I, I understand where you're coming from, but Unless you get, unless you manage to get that thing printed out and sent off somewhere, it doesn't, it doesn't happen. No, no, no. You know, I, I use the analogy of working with clay. Mm-hmm. So, you know, when I work with my, write my book, it's like the words of my clay. And I, I first throw the words on the, on the wheel and I, I try to get them into shape. Um, and then if I put, if I stop and I put that clay on the side for a while, mm-hmm. it gets hard. Mm-hmm. You, you can't work it anymore. So those people who take those manuscripts and working on 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, the, you know, the next great American novel and put it aside and figure one day they're going to get back to it. I'm sorry, that thing is hardened. And, it, it, you know, just at this point, just throw it away. Um, you know, and what happens is people get to a point, they call it writer's block. But what I call it is they get to a barrier and they and it's hard to push through those barriers. So you need to constantly be pushing through those things when it gets hard. I mean, anything in life is that way. You know, a lot of us want to give up when we, we come across something difficult. The key is to push through. And, you know, once you push through, then you, you, know, you get through the other side and then you can continue. That's what I do. So if I get stuck on a part in a story, I don't give up. You know, I keep pushing through. Um, I'm not saying every novel that I started, I finished. But uh, there's only maybe... Uh, I think maybe one or two that I've that have gone by the wayside um, that I'll probably I'll never go back to because the story just you know had nowhere to go. Um, but I don't look at that as a failure. I look at that as you know just practice. You know it's like you know if you're a runner and not every not every time you go out and run is a race. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's just practice. Um, so you know I, I don't I, I don't I'm not despondent about those um, because you know, the more you do the better you get. You know. Malcolm Caldwell said that um, you need a thousand hours to become an expert in something. Mm-hmm. So um, I, I'm probably getting close to a thousand hours of writing. I, I haven't really calculated it, but you know, I think as each book comes along, my last book is my best um, in terms of how I feel about it. Um, though I get a lot of compliments still from my first book. A Compass Tale, even, and that was just my, you know, my first attempt at fiction writing. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a journey for sure. Um, I've heard a similar thing. Instead of your first thousand hours is your best for a writer, your first 100,000 words are going to suck. So just <laughs> get them out, get them over with, and then move on to something you can be proud of. Yeah, well, meanwhile, Compass Tale was 80,000 words, my, my first 80,000 words, and I got like 56 four- and five-star reviews on Amazon. But you probably wrote a lot before you ever started that one. Um, not fiction. I did write business. Um, okay, so fair I enough. Wrote a lot of business articles, a couple of magazines, and Still I wrote counts. business books. It counts. It counts. Like sure. I, I have said, actually, just yesterday, I was talking with another author who acted like she was making a confession that some of what she did started out as fan fiction, and I said, "There's nothing wrong with that." You were motivated. You sat down and you wrote, and you were happy about the result. It doesn't have to be a blockbuster seller if it's just practice. That's fine. Right. It's more than some people did. Yeah. Well, the goal I think of any writing um, is to communicate. So, be it business writing or fictional writing, or even any art in a way, is to communicate from the creator to the to the receptor. Um, so you know, I want to make sure that if I'm telling a story that you have no trouble hearing that story or reading mm-hmm. that story or, you know, or th- absorbing that story. So it's important that I could communicate that well. And that's the key, I think, um, to being a good writer is making sure that, you know, you're, you're communicating the story. And you have a, you have a long way to go. With 80,000 words, that's, that's a long story to tell. So mm-hmm. you don't want to lose a reader along the way or them to get bored. So you have to keep them interested. You mm-hmm. got to keep the pages going. I have a, I, I developed a style um, unintentional at first, but now I keep it that way as my, I have short chapters. Mm-hmm. Um, so I might have 80 to 90 chapters in a book and uh, my, my chapters could be three, four, five, six pages long. So what I've heard is that people like short chapters. They like the idea and people complimenting, oh, I love having, I love short chapters. And it was like, 
did you do that on purpose? At, at first, no, it was just how I wrote. Um, but the more I heard back from people who said they like short chapters, because people read in small snippets. Mm -hmm. You know, you read before you go to bed, like here and there. And if there's a long chapter, you don't want to stop in the middle of the chapter. You want to finish the chapter. So they like that. Plus, I keep the chapters moving along. So you, if you three, four pages, you're on to another scene. And I'll typically also change points of view between chapters. So if I have two or three characters or two or three different points of views, I'll alternate the points of views. So I might have a female point of view to a male point of view to the antagonist points of view from chapter to chapter to chapter. Uh, so you're going from scene to scene to scene. It's almost like watching a TV show these days when the mm -hmm. things are very short. So you have like a couple, you know, a couple minutes where the character is here doing this. And then the, you know, the hero is back on another scene doing this for a couple of couple of minutes. So I sort of write in that type of a style. And I think people, since they're used to watching TV that way, they like reading their books that way as well. I would agree with that. Like I said, I often read before bed, and I, I've been known many times to flip ahead a couple pages to see if the chapter ends in the next six or eight pages. And if it does, I'll keep reading. And if it doesn't, I just put the bookmark in and call it a night. Yeah. You, you've got about five pages in my mind to really wrap this up, or I'm, I'm giving it a rest for the evening. Yeah, and, and I never thought about that. I mean, that's how I read, but I never thought about that uh to do that as a writer but it did but it does work people have commented that they enjoy that um it also works uh for the other other forms of books like uh if you do an audio book or a digital book version it i tend to think a lot of people who consume books those way seem to like it too yeah well um my first two books are on audio now uh, Cobbler's Tale and Moonflower, and my next two books, The Righteous One and Bomb Squad, are being recorded uh, right now, so they'll be out soon. And then once Bomb Squad is done, the narrator will then uh, pick up uh, Hope City and narrate that too. So I'll have all my books will be available or are available in uh, ebook, paperback, and audio. Um, so yeah, all three formats. Awesome, awesome. Uh, well. I want to make sure that we make. Uh, I want to make sure that we get enough time in here because I want to talk about where my readers can find your work because we've definitely established that it's worth looking into and I'm looking forward to reading it myself. Um, so where can we follow your adventures on the internet? Uh, my website neilperrygordon.com and that's everything is there. There's links to Amazon uh, to to buy books. Uh, you can pre-order Hope City now on Amazon. Um, the ebook e you can pre-order, the paperback, you, you can't pre-order paperbacks, but it will be out on the 20th if you prefer the paperback. So uh, yeah, neilperrygordon.com is the place to go. All right. And if we're going to pick up one of your books, what would be the best one to start with? Mm, depends what you like. Um, you know, if you want a Jewish immigration story, Cobbler's Tale is good. If you want to learn about indigenous life in the late 1600s, um, you could go up with Moonflower. If you want a metaphysical fiction story about uh, a battle in the dream world, the righteous one is fun. If you like a World War I espionage adventure story, you can go with the Bomb Squad. Or if you like a tale about uh, two young boys heading up into the Alaskan wilderness for the gold rush of 1898, pick up Hope City. Sounds good to me. I'm looking forward to Bomb Squad especially. All right, good. So, uh Neil, thanks so much for being here. I would like to have you back on after I review some of your stuff and we can maybe pick it apart a little bit. Absolutely. Let me know. I'm All right. Be. Take good care. So have a good day. Thank you, Aaron. You too.